resource. We all know that. It's a great cultural resource, but it truly is a biologic wonder. And this evening, we have a very special speaker to share his love of wildlife with us. So to introduce him, I'd like to introduce the Deputy Superintendent, Ms. Palma Wilson. Thank you. 
are we doing tonight? Yeah. Everybody get in here all right? Yes. If not, we'll do a fifth show. <laughs> that happens after we had a problem with about 300 extra people, but we did another show, which is a lot of fun for me. I uh, hope you all have fun tonight. We're going to show you some animals, my favorite videos from around the world. It's amazing that little bit, 40 uh, second thing you saw just in covers every continent in the world. Just a little clip of all the animals we get to see. And uh, a lot of the young people ask me how I got started in this business. And uh, I'll tell you, you know, all this in life, I love to live a dream. But I've been very fortunate to live two dreams, not just one. Dream to be a zookeeper someday after being raised on a farm in Tennessee. And at age 11, I started working with cleaning cages for a veterinarian, which I did for six years. And then when I was 17, he went to the little zoo in Knoxville. And I said, now I'm going to be a zookeeper someday. So kids, I never wavered from that dream. So I tell kids, I don't care if you want to be own a restaurant, be a doctor, whatever, be a teacher, be a zookeeper, just love what you do. My dad taught me three words, hard work and enthusiasm. Hard work and enthusiasm, which means hard work and love what you do, and I'm sure uh, each and every one of you hopefully can do that. But obviously the rangers here, the people from the Grand Canyon, all love what they do here as well. So I live that dream, and some of you might be my age, remember Wild Kingdom, anybody here? Oh, yeah. Wild Kingdom. Well, back when TV was pretty good. You can sit there on Sunday nights before Disney, remember? Before Disney. Now to see how old you are, everybody. How about the Cisco Kid, Soul Roar, Scott King? How to do that? Now I'm really old. I'll go back and forth. But uh, uh, that's when I would sit there at a little TV in Knoxville, look at this guy. You know, and I never even set foot out of Tennessee until I was probably 16 years old. I much less traveled to every continent in the world. And so it's really been an incredible life I've spent. And, uh, you know, I hope I can share that with you each week when you watch our shows, Into the Wild Animal Adventures, whatever bunch you want to watch. We have another one coming on TV, we do not, in uh, September on ABC every Saturday morning. It'll be called Jack Hanna's Animal Countdown, which is the almost 25,000 videotapes and this little disc we have from all over the world. Uh, you know, we have the best camouflage in the world, best uh, cats in the world, best parks in the world, obviously, with this park right leading the way. So you'll see that show as well. And then, uh, obviously, we're going to get over, so I won't be doing many more series after that. Uh, they said about the David Letterman show, I have no idea why you watch that show, because you'll learn absolutely nothing. Uh, but, but you will see tonight. You will see tonight something I didn't do for one of the shows earlier today. I want to show you some bloopers from the David Letterman show in 1985. Uh, and I shared this with the other audience, by the way. That in all my years, 26 years of doing this show, four times a year, we just got through doing it two weeks ago, four times a year, 26 years, I've never talked to him before after the show in 26 years. And so, you know, people think, you know, you know, David and I are very close on the show, but as far as outside of that, Obviously, they wouldn't be battling each other. It wouldn't be good to be real close friends. But uh, so it's, it's a different show that we do. Obviously, different Good Morning America and all the other shows that we do as well. But I uh, just hope you have fun this evening. Go see some animals. Uh, actually, the last two animals left would be maybe mountain lions, maybe cougars. So hopefully, you can get to see what this, this this place here is not just famous for what we have seen behind us there, but obviously the wildlife that's here as, as well. Uh, so I'm going to start out by saying that we're going to show you a few animals, and I had some more to say, but as I go along, you can see I plan, I don't even plan my speech, and my pants are dirty from cleaning animals, so don't anybody tell me my pants are dirty, please. I'll get them taken care of. It'll be a lot worse than that. This is Grace Stafford. Grace is from the Wildlife World Zoo in, you know, outside of Phoenix. You know, I've been buddies for about 25 years. And um, this is a little creature here. Oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry, I forgot about the camera. Just kind of jumped into that, didn't I? I can tell the animal joke, but I better not tell that joke. <laughs> While they're getting just, uh, ready right there, we just got back, everyone. You've, you've seen the shows right now uh, from the Amazon that we went to in the fall. And you also uh, have seen some shows. We just got back from Africa and Rwanda and uh, South Africa uh, 10 days ago. And we actually go back to Africa here uh, this coming uh, Thursday. I'm on the road about 265 days a year, so you can see that uh, my wife Susie does a show with me. She's here somewhere. Uh, she's left. Uh, I'm just kidding. Where's Sue? She hates standing up. She's sleeping on the floor over there. That's still over there. Oh, yeah, I'm going to tell her story. I'm going to give her a little bit of tell her story. It's a great portion of it. Um, you won't believe this. It's our 40th anniversary several years ago, okay? And my wife loves to, like, do things that are just extreme. That's all. So the point is, she said, she said, Jack, for our 40th anniversary, I think we should look at Mount Everest. I said, oh, I don't mind looking at Mount Everest. I'd like to look at Mount Everest. But I thought, well, climb Mount Everest. I said, impossible. We'd be killed. But since we didn't do that, then she wanted to do some Milford Trek in New Zealand. Couldn't do that. So then I did. Then I said, "Well, I tell you what. Let's hike across the Grand Canyon." Thinking she didn't know it. Sure enough, that's what we did. It was the greatest two days of my entire life to come across this canyon. How many of you have done that? Raise your hand. I'm sure some of you have. No, I hope I'm not the only person who's done this. No, but it really is. What you have here, folks, if you live around here, this is it is obviously the wonder of the world. 
Have you traveled the world? I can tell you this is a wonder of the world, and that's why I'm here tonight uh, doing this presentation today as well. Are you tired yet, Greg? Okay. Um, this is a deadly buzzard here. No, it's not. I'm going to let Greg tell you what this is, but this is the unique animal. Not many of you see these birds here. This is actually one of the smallest birds of prey in the world. It's called an American kestrel. Uh, very fast bird, not as fast as our next bird, but uh, very clever bird prey right here, native to the southwest. They like to eat insects and small creatures, and if the wind conditions are just right, they can actually hover. That's how fast they can move. So, uh, beautiful female, uh, uh, as you can see right here. Now, are these monogamous like the bald eagles and other birds? Other birds that I'm not sure. See, I like to, I like to ask Brady these questions because I don't know the answers, but. And I'm going to go back in the kitchen and Google the answer because I don't know. I'll just give a raise while I throw over the This bird here, everybody, is, is some people on game shows will say, what's the, what's the world's fastest animal? Right out of their mouth, Tom Tachina. All right? That's the world's fastest land mammal. We just got the film in the chat two weeks ago, by the way. And the cheetah is the world's fastest land mammal, clocking 70 miles an hour. I wish I could talk about the cheetah. We just had the cheetahs day before yesterday, and Columbus and our speech is there. But uh, this is the world's fastest animal, uh, the peregrine falcon, clocking over 220 miles an hour. 220 miles an hour. Uh, the animal is almost built like a stealth bomber. If you see it flying, you wonder where we get our design for our airplanes or whatever our jets. And if you see this animal, you understand how the stealth bomber was probably even. It's just magnificent when this animal flies. And how do I know that? In 1972, everybody, I, I got first hand experience about the peregrine falcon. Being very young back then, I knew nothing much about birds. My name is Steve Howdy. He's a master falconer. If you've ever seen a real falconer, it's incredible to watch them. So Steve was down there in Silver Springs, Florida, and I was there. I don't get think where I was with the animals there. But uh, he said, Jack, he said, uh, do you know what I want to do? He said, uh, you ever seen a, a peregrine falcon fly at 220 miles an hour? I said, no. He said, well, well, there it is. He looked at just a speck of the sky. He said, now, open your legs like this, and I'm going to fly the falcon between your legs at 200 miles an hour. <laughs> They were not too bright at the time. I said, oh, that'd be incredible. You know, everything would happen. Plus, I hadn't had my kids yet. But anyway, uh, this, <laughs> this thing is up there, right? And it comes down like a speck that becomes bigger and bigger. And the thing, folks, because he had the, the bait on the string, if you've ever seen him working with an animal behind me. And that thing went through my legs. I, I, don't, I, was, I don't know what 200 miles an hour is and how fast that is. But that thing went through there. It was a thing like that. It was the most amazing thing I've ever done in seeing this animal do it. It was a peregrine falcon. Now, I understand, which I did not know until today, that this bird has come back one of the most uh, numerous birds in the, in the game, right? Yeah, the highest uh, breeding population in the United States, the, the highest breeding population in the United States is in the Grand Canyon. Wow. Give yourself a round of applause for that man. That's amazing. That's amazing. You can see this bird is almost gone in many other parts of our country. If you go to, if you go to Chicago, New York City, Columbus, Ohio, I don't care where it is, look at the skyscrapers. I just did one several years, five years ago, on the Paragon Top in Chicago, about a 40, 50 story skyscraper, where they had the cameras up there sell this nest for about, until the eggs were laid, hatched, the whole thing. So they, why are they there? Pigeons. Obviously, that's why they're living all over the place. And it's just a great thing here in the Grand Canyon to see this bird come back so well, as well as the condor. You all know about the condor situation here, don't you? Well, no one, no one would know that situation. And, and I'm sorry, the, the gentleman's name that runs it? Chris Parrish. Chris, right. He was here earlier today. And what an incredible man, what they have done. And guess where those birds, those birds were totally out extinct here in this area, right? They came from the San Diego Zoo and the Los Angeles Zoo. Some people may tell you about what zoos do. Another thing that you might have misheard from some animal rights folks, that about 98% of our animals in zoos in this country come from other zoos. They don't come from the wild, all right? If I want to get a wild cheetah, or any, almost anything, I can go to uh, Africa with our veterinarians, go there and collect the, uh, the uh, sperm and collect the eggs from the cheetah. Vice versa, I can take it from there to there. What's going on in the zoo world today is phenomenal what we're doing. If it hadn't been for San Diego and LA, this bird would be totally extinct in, in, in this entire area. So what a great job they did and what this gentleman's doing here of bringing the magnificent condor. We just got them filming Andean condors in uh, these shows are coming up now in November in Chile. Uh, it's just a beautiful bird. But this bird here just says it all when it comes to speed. Thank you so much for bringing it. Thank you, your wildlife sanctuary in Phoenix. The Adobe Mountain Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. Right. You do a lot of jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Now this here, everybody, this right here is, is uh, we'll get focused here. This right here is, David Letterman said, this got something got screwed up in the lab. Uh, that's what I just said. This is a fennec fox. Now, I couldn't find a fox locally, okay? 
So just dream, if you would. But this, there are, there's a red fox, gray fox, the arctic fox. There's also, this is the finnick fox from northern Africa. Another unique number, you might not know this, in London, England alone, I'm not talking about England, I'm talking about in London, England alone, they now estimate 2.2 million foxes live there. 2.2 million in London, okay? That's how the fox can adapt to our environment, like the coyote has. This animal here is a finnick fox from northern Africa, the Sahara Desert. This animal can go its entire life, this is a mammal, it goes its entire life without ever drinking water. How is that? Because this animal gets its water from like little lizards, snakes, poisonous little creatures, especially the big black scorpion. They love to eat the big black scorpion. They pop his head off in a split second. It's full grown, it's nocturnal as well. And those ears are for what? For what? Hearing, right? To hear little insects, worms, when they probably eat the about 60% insects anyway. Uh, but it's, it's for more than that. It's to keep it alive. Because if you ever see elephants in the Serengeti or elephants in zoological parks at the heat of the day, 110 degrees, how are the elephants out there eating in the heat of the day? Obviously, they have the pachyderm has thick skin. They have mud and sand on their skin, so they don't have to worry about a sunburn. But they do have to worry about the heat. And the reason the elephant has big ears and why they flop them all and flap them all the time when you're out there eating is because it's like a radiator. There are thousands of blood vessels in that elephant's ear. If it wasn't for those ears, he wouldn't be out there. He'd be dead. He'd be gone. So it's just like a radiator, just flapping them all the time. Same thing with this creature here in the, in the Sahara Desert. Those big ears keep him alive out there. Even though it's a nocturnal creature, it does keep cold in the desert at night, but the daytime gets very, very hot. So those ears are very, very vital. That animal is about seven years old, full grown, smallest fox in the world, the fitting fox. Thank you so much for bringing that to me. Now these are a couple of birds here. I'm going to let them talk about them. Uh, matter of fact, we have, this is the first show we've had this bird here. They, these birds, by the way, folks, are all birds that have been rehabilitated. In just a second, I'm going to show you a golden eagle, which is the most magnificent birds in the world. Bigger, much bigger than our bald eagle. But these are birds that are either hit by cars, shot, uh, electrical power lines, whatever, they can't go back out in the wild. And we use them for education, which is very important. Okay, the uh, particular bird that I'm holding is called a zone-tailed hawk. The nice thing about them is if you watch the condors or turkey vultures flying, these birds will we'll get one or two on the outskirts of them, and they have the same wing pattern as a turkey vulture. So if you have the rabbit down below eating and out playing, and you look up and you see a vulture or a condor, you're supposed to be safe, right? They eat dead things. Well, that's when the uh, zone tail drops in. <laughs> what happened this week? Electrocution. So a lot of these animals, what happens to them with a lot of power, especially the bald eagle as well. Thank you for bringing that. This right here one is a red-tailed hawk. A lot of you have seen this bird. Most every state in the country. By the way, I don't know about, about your state here, but the red-tailed hawk is a, is a protected species in most all states. All birds of prey, for example, are protected species in most all states. That is a red-tailed hawk. The velvet's red tail about a year old. Uh, they're not as fast, obviously, as a peregrine falcon. I would say maybe 120, 130, 40 miles an hour. Uh, but they're a neat creature, and they're also it's a bird called, do you have the Harris hawk here? The Harris hawk? Yeah. Uh, if you've ever seen a Harris hawk, they're, they're the only hawk that I know in the world. The only, one of the only birds of prey that will hunt with each other. In other words, they hunt uh, with, like, somebody, one hawk sees something, the other one will help catch it. Or even Harris hawks get on some of the fence posts and stack themselves on each other. And, of course, that's an animal. I'm not saying it looks similar to a Harris hawk. That's the red-tailed hawk we all see, even on the interstates here. You know, they're after rats and mice in the center of the, the roads here. Thank you so much for bringing that bird. Well, how do you get injured? <laughs> Electrocution as well. Now, this that's called mating. It's not hurting the bird, it's called mating. It's not hurting the bird whatsoever. Thank you so much for bringing that for the sanctuary. Okay, next we're going to have This is up here we picked up out the lobby a minute ago. <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of funny to you, but just two weeks ago, I was in South Africa at a, on, on, on a game reserve. It was a, a pretty nice place, to, not tent camping at this time, but a pretty nice place. And I was walking through the lobby, and I said, Mr. Kennedy, if you come over here, man, we have a, a, a like a, a, what did King Cobra? It was a, not a Sudanese Cobra, I don't know it was a Cobra. And it was in the lobby, and people were trying to check in, and I was over here going, well, that is something. Look at that Cobra. Of course, that didn't do well with the check-in people, but uh, <laughs> I found it very fascinating. Uh, this is everybody, is what they call the Gila Monster. And uh, I have no idea why the, the, the monster is a body animal, because obviously everybody all of a sudden, you know, it is a, a very venomous lizard. And there's only two poisonous lizards on it, right, Greg, in the world. Uh, the, some people think the Komodo dragon is poisonous here. Well, the Komodo dragon is an animal, obviously the biggest lizard in the world. The Komodo dragon can, can bite, and when, let's say it can't take the dragon, because they have incredible teeth, but the Komodo dragon is, is like a bunch bigger than this table here. They're big. We raised them in the Columbus Zoo. And uh, in the wild, once they do bite everybody, it's almost a fatal bite. 
only causes the bacteria in your teeth. It's, even in the zoo world, if, some, if one of our people ever get bit by it, they have to go immediately to the hospital right off the bat. Uh, because that, that, that uh, bacteria there is just the worst of it because of rotten meat they eat and everything. But then the Colonial Dragons can track that animal for up to uh, 10 days to two weeks just by putting that tongue out and just following the scent of the blood from the bite and stuff. Uh, this is the heel monster here. I think it's venom is, is in the back of the mouth, correct? It's neurotoxic, all right, which means not, not like uh, the rattlesnake, which is hemotoxic. It's kind of neurotoxic, so you just kind of, you know, you know a rattlesnake bite kind of hurts. But this one here kind of you bites you and you just kind of go to sleep. You know, neurotoxic. Just don't mess with animals. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and as he said, you have to be pretty. You have to be pretty rough with all these animals. Are you? you really do. Uh, I don't know what the status is this animal in the wild here. They're protected species, right? And some people call it the bearded dragon, whatever it might be. But that is a, the the the, the heel monster. You know what they call it here, where you all live. So it's a beautiful, beautiful creature. And by the way, his tail there. If you look at his tail, a lot of times what these animals will do, if the predator or something comes down, a big bird of prey, whatever it might be, they can actually put that tail out there. That animal will take the tail off. He'll go away, you know, he tricked me. He's got my tail, he didn't kill me. Uh -huh. so that's what they do there with that tail. There. Thank you so much, Craig. Appreciate that. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 now, this first show a couple of videos tonight. This is one of them, one of them here, and we have some more animals for you. Uh, this is a video of one of my favorite videos that I did about 12 years ago in New Mexico uh, with some, uh, science, some biologists, some uh, game and fish guys taking a census of the black bear in New Mexico. Many of you know that the bears come back very well, the black bear, in most all of our states. Matter of fact, the black bear now exists in great numbers, about 40 miles out of New York City, in, in, in Jersey there. Uh, so the bears are coming back. Well, that's why there's hunting of bears to control populations of certain animals. But this is a time when I, about 12 years ago, whatever it was, in New Mexico, out of Silver City or Silver Gate, whatever it is, up in the mountains, about 10,000 feet in April, uh, doing the census. And then this one bear collared. It was a female. And uh, we were out there tracking it. And I want to show you something. Now, I used the word hibernation in this video. It's not correct. It's more of a deep sleep. Hibernation like a ground squirrel. <clears throat> like go on the ground and his heart rate drops almost nothing. The bear just, you know, come like, I don't know, November, October, depending like we have a house in Montana. Uh, we love, I love Montana too. And, and, and the bears there, it gets real cold, they just kind of go in and find their den and go to sleep. Uh, and sometimes they have their babies, obviously, while they're, while they're sleeping. Uh, then in the wintertime, it gets real hot. The bears will, will wake up and come out kind of groggy like they're just, you know, half there. And they go back in their den. So it's, and by the way, these little bears are about six, seven ounces where they more like a rat. So I want you, it's only about four minutes, sit back and look what I found inside this one uh, bear den up there. We'll roll the video. Yeah. 